This talk is going to be about hemiplegia, which is paralysis to one side of the body. And before I start, I really want to say thanks to Dr. Christine Tomkinson, who's a neurologist, who helped me uh, through this because it's been an interesting process of learning for me too, getting this one ready. Let me tell you what this talk comes from. A uh, long time ago, when I was going through my initial paramedic training back in 89, um, we talked about stroke, and we talked about it very quickly, and we said basically weakness to one side of the body or one side of the face indicates a stroke, and we left it at that. It's good enough to know. Um, and then some of us were confused, and we spoke about it, and we said, so is it weakness to one side of the face and the same side of the body, or is it weakness to one side of the face and the other side of the body? And if you take a look at some books, it says weakness to one side of the face, one side of the body. But then we would look at some of the patients and we'd realize that in real life, they actually have weakness to one side of the face and weakness to the other side of the body. And it was one of those things that I always had in my head to try and eventually one day figure out. But I just kind of never really got to it. And um, it's only recently that I've been teaching neurology this semester to students that the issue came up and I thought, <sighs> What is that? I, mean, I don't actually know. <clears throat> and it's an interesting process right now. Before we even start this talk, <clears throat> excuse me, ask yourself, what happens in a stroke? Is it weakness to one side of the face and one side of the body, ipsilateral, or is it weakness to one side of the face and the other side of the body, contralateral? When you talk with a lot of paramedics, if you ask them that, you'll get a lot of different answers. And some people are very certain of their answers. And some people intelligently will say that it depends on what side or what part of the brain the damage is in, which is actually the correct answer. Uh, but then you can push them a little bit further and say, okay, how? How does that work? What part of the brain makes ipsilateral and what part makes contralateral? And I've found personally that that's a place where most paramedics go, uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> which is a fair enough answer. So that's what this talk is going to be about. At the end of this talk, we're going to uh, have figured out what causes ipsilateral, what causes contralateral, and what causes other sort of hemiplegia. We're obviously going to talk a little bit about stroke, but that's not really the focus of what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is this presentation of paralysis to one side of the body and what causes it, because there are things other than stroke that can cause it, and we'll talk about that as well. So this, here's what we'll go through. We'll go through what you actually need to know in terms of a stroke. Basic bare bones, this is the bedrock of what you absolutely have to know, and it's quite simple. Uh, and then we'll start to talk about the more complex stuff. So we'll talk about what part of the brain it is that actually generates the impulses for movement in our body, and that's the primary motor cortex. Then we'll talk a little bit about how the primary motor cortex communicates those signals down to the rest of the body, and those are the neuron pathways, the upper and the lower. Then we'll talk about what happens if something goes wrong in those pathways and how does it manifest. So lesions, I'm not sure if lesions is a word you're familiar with. It's a great medical word. It basically means a boo-boo. It means something's gone wrong with it. So if there's damaged tissue or some sort of pathological process going on, then instead of saying, you know, it's a contusion, abrasion, laceration, ischemia, anything like that, we just say it's a lesion. It's a There's a problem there. So we'll talk about what lesions can happen in those neuron pathways and how they clinically present. And then to tie it all together, we'll do a few case presentations so that you can uh, take a look at how patients present in the real world and what that indicates about the pathology that's going on inside their bodies. So let's start, first of all, with the absolute need to know about hemiplegia. And when we talk about hemiplegia, we are often, though not always, talking about a stroke. So it's important as a paramedic to be able to recognize if your patient is having a stroke and it's important to recognize that that's a very time critical problem and that they should basically be immediately transported lights and sirens with notification to the receiving facility. If you know nothing more than that you're, you're doing well for you know two o'clock in the morning when you can't think. As I often tell my students you know, we get into situations where we're kind of stuck and we're going, uh, I don't know what's going on. What should I do? And in those situations, 
You should do ABCs. You should put them on the stretcher and you should transport. If you're really stuck, that's what you do. If you're really not sure about hemiplegia, this is what we do. We do the FAST test. So the first thing is the face. And we just ask someone to smile. Big smile. Show us your teeth. and Scrunch up your face as much as possible like that. And if both sides of their face go up equally, that's a pass. If one side of their face goes up and the other side goes down, that's a fail. Then we ask to take a look at their arms. And what we do is we ask them to put their hands out like this, like they're holding a pizza box is often how we say it. And we ask them to hold their hands there for 10 seconds. And if they're able to do that without any of their hands dropping, <clears throat> then that's a pass. If one of their hands starts to drop down while they're holding it, that's a fail. So we ask them to do that for 10 seconds with their eyes open. Then we ask them to do it for 10 seconds, 10 further seconds with their eyes closed and we watch for this pronator drift. It's called pronator drift because this is pronation, this is supination. So we ask them to pronate, hold the pizza box up, and then we watch to see if their one of their hands drifts down. If it stays up, that's a pass. If it drifts down, that's a fail of the second test. The third test is we ask them to repeat something, ask them to articulate. So we say something like, the sky is blue today. If they can't say it properly, if they're very uh, 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 so dysphagic, or if they can't actually repeat the words, if they just get confused, or if they just look at you and go, yeah, uh, yeah, then that's, which people will do, it's a little freaky, um, that's a fail. If they can repeat the, well, the words that you say, if they say, the sky is blue today, then that's a pass. If they fail any of those three tests, anyone in isolation or all of them together or any combination of them, then we just assume that they're having a stroke. We put the stretcher up to like, you know, halfway, 45 degrees, <clears throat> give them some oxygen if they're hypoxic, below about 96%, protect the airway, do the basic stuff, get a line in place, get them to the hospital, and notify the receiving hospital that we're bringing in somebody who we think might have a stroke. That's, that's the basic, that's what you need to know about hemiplegia. If you see it and you do this test and they fail any one or any combination of those first three tests. This is a time critical patient. You need to get them to the hospital, so get them to the hospital. It says call 911 on this slide. Uh, of course, not all countries use 911. In Australia, here, they use triple zero. And of course, if you're a paramedic watching this, you are 911. So you don't call 911 because you're already there. You go to the hospital instead. So let's go beyond that. You can stop the lecture here. If you go, that's all I really want to know, then that's fine. Stop here and you've got all that you need to know. However, we can go on further and we can go into what for basic providers is a nice to know. And we can go into what is, I would say, becoming need to know information if you are at the level beyond graduate entry. So here in Australia, when you graduate as a paramedic, you're called an advanced care paramedic. And if you do your subsequent training, usually a diploma, postgrad diploma, after so they do three years of undergrad and then they do two years as a postgrad diploma, and that would be considered a, a intensive care paramedic or a mobile intensive care paramedic, or in Queensland where I am now, they would call that a critical care paramedic. So that's the next level beyond graduation. In Canada, you graduate as a primary care paramedic and then you move to advanced care paramedic. In the States, you know, this would be EMT level stuff is the FAST test. And then if you go on to uh, NREMTP paramedic, then this is, I think this is starting to get to be stuff that we're deciding in our profession, you should probably know this. So it's nice to know at the basic level. And it's, I would say, becoming, you should know sort of stuff at the higher level. It's not really going to change your treatment a whole lot. But it does indicate that you have a, a deeper, richer, broader, more comprehensive understanding of what's going on neurologically in your patients. And there are there's progress being made in terms of treating CVAs. <clears throat> and uh, we're starting to have, uh, you know, uh, trucks that will go out that have CT scanners on them that take a look inside. They'll do the imaging of people's brains to figure out what sort of a stroke you're having. So let's talk about strokes very quickly, although that's not the only cause for hemiplegia. Uh, stroke is, in medical terms, called a cerebrovascular accident. So cerebral is brain, vascular is the blood vessels, and accident is, oops, something happened. So there's an oopsie in the vessels in your brain. That's a CVA. There's two types of oops oopsies. 
there's two types of accidents. The first one is an ischemic, and I'll start with a slide. First one's hemorrhagic. What that means is that the blood vessels in your brain have burst and you're bleeding into the parenchyma of the brain. So the brain itself is a fairly closed vault and we start pumping fluid into there through our blood system. And as the fluid goes into the brain, it starts to compress the brain tissue itself. There's not a lot of room in there. So it starts compressing the brain tissue throughout the whole brain because the pressure is increasing in the brain. It's very difficult to localize uh, the effects of a hemorrhagic CVA in a patient. On the other hand, an ischemic CVA is when the blood vessels going through the brain get blocked on the inside through an embolism or a thrombus, and the, the blood flow stops and everything downstream starts to die because it's not getting enough oxygen, enough sugar. The brain doesn't store oxygen or sugar, so it's dependent on the beat-to-beat -beat impulse of the blood. And if we don't get enough blood to the brain, it immediately starts to suffer and die. So it's very critical. However, it's much more specific because it's just a specific part of the brain, everything downstream from the lesion that starts to die, and it's not diffusely throughout the whole brain. So in general terms, hemorrhagic give us more global symptoms and ischemic give us more specific symptoms. And like in a myocardial infarction, you can sometimes localize what part of the brain you suspect it's in by the pathology that presents inside the patient. <clears throat> Having said that, I want to be really cautious and really strongly emphasize that it is impossible to clinically differentiate between a hemorrhagic and an ischemic stroke. You cannot do that in the field, not unless you're Superman with x-ray vision, which none of us are, so you cannot tell if it's hemorrhagic or ischemic. You can have your suspicions, but you can never be certain enough about whether or not it's hemorrhagic versus ischemic to actually guide your treatment. And that's really, really critically important because if you are under the delusion <clears throat> that you can differentiate a hemorrhagic versus an ischemic CVA in the field, then you're going to start treating it. And if you say, oh yeah, this is ischemic for sure, I can tell because it's pinpoint, it's pontine, blah, blah, blah. If you start getting into that mistaken and foolish mindset, then you might start giving aspirin or other antiplatelet drugs to someone that you have diagnosed as ischemic, which would be the right thing to do. But since we don't know that it's ischemic, there's a chance that it's hemorrhagic. About 80% of strokes, depending on what textbook you read, roughly 80%. Um, that's a broad number, are ischemic, and roughly 20% are hemorrhagic. So if you think, oh, you know, look at the odds and look at the presentation, I'll give them some aspirin, and it turns out that it's actually a hemorrhagic stroke, you've just basically done a whole lot of damage because they were bleeding, and they're depending on their ability to create a blood clot to stop that bleeding, and then you just gave them a drug which blocks their ability to clot their blood. And I always think it's a bit of an exaggeration when, when paramedic instructors say, and then you killed them. Um, but you very seriously could kill somebody by giving them aspirin when they're having a hemorrhagic CVA. That's a bit of a, pardon the pun, that's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, oh, that's bad. But it's true. So what I really want to point out is that you can, I've never met you, but I can tell you something about yourself for certain. You cannot tell the difference between a hemorrhagic and an ischemic stroke in the field, so don't start treating it as if it's hemorrhagic or as if it's ischemic. You can have your suspicions in the back of your mind, but don't let those pass that threshold of becoming so certain that you start to treat that way, okay? Really important, because you could kill somebody if you do this wrong, even though I hate when people say that. Let's talk about what makes us move. This is a bit of a simplification because there are various parts in the brain that make us move, but the primary part of the brain that makes us move is the motor cortex. Motor means movement, cortex means bark. Uh, cortex is, we talk about the cortex of organs as sort of the outer part of the organs. We talk about the renal cortex, the cerebral cortex. Those are the bark, the outer sort, the other parts of the organ. So we have a frontal lobe, we have the, the posterior lobe, and between those two lobes, my head is perfect for this because I'm bald, you can see it easily, um, we've got this line that sort of breaks them into different lobes, and that's called the central solstice, this particular one that runs through. And if you look on this picture here, 
running down along there is the central solstice. So all of this is the frontal lobe, and at the back of the frontal lobe is kind of, you think of this as a loaf of bread with slices coming down like this. The slice that's in the toaster here at the very back of the frontal lobe is called the primary motor cortex. Primary because it's not the only motor cortex in the brain or the motor center in the brain, but it's, it's the big one. So when I'm talking to you, <clears throat> when I'm articulating with my face or my hands and I'm making these motor movements, it's that part of the brain, the primary motor cortex, that says, wiggle your fingers to emphasize the point. And it sends the signal down through neurons to my body and my body moves in response. So that's where it starts. That's where the impulse for movement originates. And if we take a look at the primary motor cortex uh, more carefully, imagine again that that primary motor cortex is a slice of bread in my head, and I've pulled it out of the toaster, and then I cut it in half, and now here's a half of that cortex slice. This is the inside part of our brain. This is the outer part of our brain following the curvature of our head. So we're looking at it sort of this way, and this is the left side of the primary motor cortex. And what you'll notice is that the primary motor cortex is broken into regions that control different parts of the body. We start here with the foot and the leg and the hips. So it's kind of like the body leaning over and the hand extending out. I kind of think of this as, and this is just my weird way of thinking, but have you ever seen those uh, videos on parkour, uh, people on YouTube that they're jumping from building to building and doing all this stuff and invariably people wipe out. And when they wipe out, they go, Ugh, and they land. And I think about somebody jumping from one building to another and they land halfway on the building kind of like this and they go, Ugh, and they fall down. So their legs are hanging down the building and their body is uh, over the top of the building with their arms stretched out because they really got winded and wiped out. And then we've got coming down, we've got the head, and then down into the tongue, and then down into the larynx. It's just stretched them out that much. So foot, hip, trunk, arm, hand, face, tongue, larynx. That's the way that our primary motor cortex is laid out. So if I could selectively go in and create a lesion right in the cortex here, very specifically, and just kill off some tissue, that would primarily affect the hand. And you'd see some um, effect in the arm and some in the face, but primarily, if you could pinpoint it really carefully, that would be in the hand. If I could pinpoint the lesion down here, that would be the foot. If I could pinpoint the lesion down over here, that would be the face. So these are the, the centers, the offices of where the information comes from. And if I wipe out that particular part of the office, then that particular part of the body doesn't move properly anymore. So you can see now how we can localize. Because if I say to you, this patient can't move their foot, but they can move the rest of their body, where in the primary motor cortex do you think the lesion is? You can say, oh, it's in the center part here, the mid part of the brain and the lowest portion of the, of the primary motor cortex. If I said they had a problem with their larynx, we know we're way over in this geography of the primary motor cortex, and they're talking, and you see a patient who's speaking that way, we'll often say to them, is that your normal voice? Or we'll ask family or bystanders, they sound a little hoarse to you? And the family will go, yeah, they really do. You know, like, what's going on with that? then you can think to yourself that one of the problems could be that they've got a lesion in the laryngeal part of the primary motor cortex. See how this works? So understanding this geography is really important, and you should be able to sketch this. You should have this Im imprinted in your mind. So it's easy to do. Just draw a little, you know, sort of semicircle thing, and then just imagine your parkour kid who's wiped out and his head's come off and it's smeared out along down the side of the primary motor cortex here. And that's how you can remember <clears throat> how the primary motor cortex looks and moves, and that's the geography of this area, which you need to know if you want to be able to start localizing lesions. So rule number one, know what the primary cortex is, or you know, uh, task number one, know what the primary motor cortex is and know the geography of it as it goes through the brain. Let's move on. The next thing we need to know, knowing where the primary motor cortex is in the brain, is how the blood vessels feed the brain, because it's problems in those blood vessels 
that cause the lesions in that part of the brain. This is always really kind of confusing. And part of the reason that I find it kind of confusing is because people draw pictures like this, and I go, baby, 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 that's like way too much for my brain to understand because I'm not really all that smart. And when I see something overwhelming like this, I just go, yeah, that's, that's too much for me. I have to simplify that.